if an alien civilization wanted to communicate with us, then they might well choose that very special, natural wavelength to send their message. Are aliens calling home? In the far reaches of space where silence is king, astronomers have picked up on signals never heard before, a disturbing discovery that has broken through the barrier of our cosmic isolation. And of course, NASA has warned of a terrifying object that is hidden from view and sending mysterious radio signals to our blue planet. These unknown transmissions defy conventional explanation, sparking a frenzy of speculation and fear worldwide. As governments and citizens alike try to make sense of this extraterrestrial message, one question keeps popping up. What or who is reaching out to us from the depths of the universe, and what do they want? Join us as we explore why NASA warns about unknown objects sending radio messages to Earth. Thanks to NASA's Kepler mission, astronomers have identified more than 5,000 exoplanets in our tiny corner of the Milky Way galaxy alone. The idea that we are the only intelligent life forms in the universe becomes unfathomable when one considers the immense size of space and time in relation to those 5,000 possibly inhabitable planets. The team studying Proxima Centauri at Australia's Parkes Observatory discovered the unusual signal, which they called BLC-1, while conducting their decade-long hunt for extraterrestrial broadcasts from the nearest million stars, Breakthrough, Listen. It's not out of the ordinary to encounter strange things from time to time, but this particular instance is intriguing as it's a peculiarity that is causing us to consider potential next actions. BLC-1 is the most tantalizing detection breakthrough has made so far in its search for extraterrestrial intelligence, or SETI. Beginning with Frank Drake's Project Ozma in 1960, scientists have been searching the sky for radio signals that may have an artificial source for the past 60 years. Unlike the radio waves that the universe generates on its own, these alien whispers are thought to resemble human transmissions quite a little. Only a small portion of the radio spectrum would be covered by these broadcasts. In addition, they would have a distinctive drift that points either toward or away from Earth, suggesting that the radio source is emanating from a faraway celestial body, such a planet circling a star. The only thing that can generate signals like that, according to Sheikh, is human technology. Since our Wi-Fi, cell towers, GPS and satellite radio all mimic the signals we're looking for, it's nearly impossible to distinguish between space-based and terrestrial sources of interference. Astronomers have found numerous potential signals over the years. Some of them were discovered to originate from pulsars, the fast rotating remnants of extinguished stars that release radio waves into space, and other sources that had been previously unknown to astronomers. It was at first thought that the earliest known fast radio bursts which are short bursts of radio waves that are still mostly a mystery, might have been man-made messages. Periton signals, which are less intense bursts of radio emission, also caused experts to scratch their heads until they figured out where they came from. A microwave oven. Possible sources of BLC-1's interference include an unidentified satellite, an aircraft flying overhead, a ground-based transmitter in the telescope's field of view, or even something more commonplace like malfunctioning electronics in a nearby building or a passing vehicle. The ability to distinguish between our own technology and a faraway techno signature is the deciding factor. And then there are the signals that astronomers haven't been able to definitively pin to a natural source, such as the famous WOW signal. The Ohio State University Radio Observatory, better known as Big Ear, started its sweeping sky scans, seeking even the faintest signs of extraterrestrial broadcasts in 1973. A roar, not a whimper, was the first startling indication they got on a summer night in 1977. Jerry Amon, an Ohio State professor volunteering with the Big Ear SETI experiment that summer in 1977, was no stranger to the data the telescope produced. While reviewing data from three days prior on August 18, 1977, Emmon discovered something quite unexpected. Rather than the typical sequence of ones, twos, and fours, a steady flow of letters and numbers appeared, indicating a radio transmission that was 30 times louder than the ambient noise in space. Eamon, being the teacher that he was, took out a red marker and eagerly circled the mysterious sequence 
6 Eki Dou J5, and excitedly scribbled next to it a single word. Wow! The so-called wow signal, which occurred almost 35 years ago, is still considered the closest encounter that humans have ever had with an alien intelligence. A large number of astronomers and amateur ufologists attribute the unusual features of the 72-second radio wave burst to a celestial source. In the decades since that original wow moment, no one has been able to replicate the signal or identify its definitive source, cosmic or earthly. Before broadening its emphasis, the quest for alien intelligence initially concentrated on our solar system. In the 1960s, when SETI was first established, astronomers immediately wrote off the possibility of really visiting a planet beyond our solar system. Similar to the distance between Earth and the nearest inhabited planet, the technical advancements required to transport humanity across the galaxy remain light years away. Instead, the SETI sciences decided to stay on Earth. But keep an ear on the heavens. If intelligent life is out there, SETI decided, then it must have an understanding of radio waves and the electromagnetic spectrum. Like us, the alien species probably don't have unlimited energy resources to travel around the universe looking for friends. The most efficient way to say, hello universe, we're here, is to send a radio transmission. Scientists from SETI had to decide next where to listen. Philip Morrison and Giuseppe Cocconi, two physicists from Cornell, advocated for the best guess theory in the early 1960s. If an alien civilization were smart enough to control the electromagnetic spectrum, the two men reasoned, it would try to communicate with Earth in a common language that everyone could grasp. According to Morrison and Cocconi, the most prevalent electromagnetic frequency is given out by hydrogen, the most abundant element in the cosmos. The scientists at SETI came to the conclusion that if an alien signal were to choose one frequency to transmit a message over great distances, it would be that one. The quest to find extraterrestrial life thus started. Astronomers wait for the slightest indication of an anomalous signal arriving over the 1,420 megahertz frequency using massive radio telescopes, which zero in on a single small area of the sky. As soon as the telescope has finished listening to one little area of the sky, it goes on to the next and the process continues indefinitely. And that's exactly what Jerry Amon and other city volunteers were doing with the Big Ear Telescope at Ohio State back in the summer of 1977. They were listening to a sliver of the sky near the constellation Sagittarius and measuring the strength of the signal detected on the 1,420 megahertz channel. But what makes this signal worthy of Jerry Amon's famous, wow? Why does it look to many astronomers like a message from an alien planet? First, it has to do with the hydrogen line. The frequency of the wow signal was recorded as 1,420.4556 megahertz, almost exactly the electromagnetic wavelength of hydrogen. If an alien signal from an extraterrestrial intelligence were to choose a single frequency to broadcast a long-range message, SETI scientists concluded, that's the one. The second interesting thing about the WOW signal is its shape. Radio signal shapes show how they appear when plotted against time. Why is the form of the signal important? This is due to the fact that its shape is consistent with that of an object emanating from space. The WOW signal is also interesting because of how sharp it is. Stars and galaxies, the most common natural radio wave sources, typically generate radio waves throughout a wide frequency spectrum. On the other hand, the WOW signal was so narrow that it had to have been created by an artificial transmitter, either by humans or extraterrestrials. Knowing where the signal is coming from completes the picture. As it pointed toward the galactic center, the Big Ear Telescope picked up a patch of sky close to the constellation Sagittarius. If you were an extraterrestrial civilization wishing to communicate with another sentient being, you could direct your transmission toward the galaxy's densest star cluster. The WOW signal remains one of the most tantalizing mysteries in the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. While many astronomers and enthusiasts believe it was a genuine message from an alien civilization, others remain skeptical. In 2015, Breakthrough Listen kicked off a decade-long search funded by Silicon Valley investor Yuri Milner. 
And so far, the team hasn't found anything definitive in their scans of the skies. Breakthrough began directing the Parkes telescope toward Proxima Centauri in April 2019. This was not done to find extraterrestrial life, but rather to gain a better understanding of the enormous flares that small red dwarf stars like Proxima often release. Shane Smith, a student at Michigan's Hillsdale College who was involved with Breakthrough, detected BLC-1, which seemed to be beaming from the star while processing those data. In spite of its faintness, BLC-1 managed to pass all the tests used by the Breakthrough team to eliminate the millions of human-generated signals. Its bandwidth was narrow, it seemed to fluctuate in frequency, and it vanished when the telescope looked away from Proxima. Over the following days, four similar signals appeared, although some have been ruled out as radio interference. If BLC-1 is, against all odds, a postcard from the star system next door, then statistically speaking, the Milky Way must be absolutely stuffed with communicating civilizations, says the SETI Institute's Seth Shostak. In this case, there would be more than a half billion societies out there in our own galaxy. That seems like a lot. Following the discovery, the scientists reobserved Proxima Centauri, but came up empty-handed. In addition to maintaining the Parkes telescope's focus on Proxima, scientists are attempting to devise new tests that may help them determine the source of the signal. Is something or someone trying to communicate with us? Earth has been receiving peculiar radio blasts for decades, and scientists still aren't sure where it's coming from. And to make matters even more alarming, researchers have now realized that the signals have been arriving at our planet since 1988, but no one understands what object might be sending them. Energy bursts of varied intensities have been detected every 22 minutes for the past 35 years, with intervals of up to five minutes. Before this object appeared to disprove the impossibility of sending such a signal with such a frequency, and kind of brightness for so long, scientists felt it was impossible. The latest publication titled A Long Period Radio Transient Active for Three Decades detailed how the object that has been detected releasing signals is being referred to as GPMJ 1839 It wasn't until they dug into the archives that they discovered this signal has been pinging Earth since 1988, even though it might be located 15,000 light years away. A possible explanation for the flashing could be the presence of pulsars, which are neutron stars that produce radio bursts as a result of their rapid spinning. When these emissions do eventually reach Earth, they are typically detected as a burst that is both bright and short, like a spinning lighthouse flash. If the object's rotation speed is high enough and its magnetic field is strong enough, our planet can detect its signals. However, pulsar signals typically disappear a few months or years after they begin to produce them. This is called the death line. It happens when their magnetic field becomes insufficient to produce additional high energy radiation. It appears that this signal, however, is unique in that it has been detected on Earth for over 30 years. Alternately, it might be a magnetar, which is a type of neutron star with a stronger magnetic field than a pulsar, but significantly slower rotational velocity. But according to Natasha Hurley Walker, a radio astronomer from Australia's International Center for Radio Astronomy Research and the object's main author, the object has been found to spin too slowly to emit radio waves. In other words, it has crossed the death line. This remarkable object challenges our understanding of neutron stars and magnetars, which are some of the most exotic and extreme objects in the universe. It is remarkable, whatever mechanism is responsible for this. So what happens if today's silence suddenly gives way to tomorrow's discovery of alien life? Would it be a cause for celebration if word got out that someone was out there? Assuming the public couldn't cope with the news, many believe the revelation would be covered up as fast as a mafia informant. Alternatively, and far more terrifyingly, kept hidden since an illegal reply would reveal the precise location of hostile interplanetary battle wagons to an enemy race. That's melodramatic enough. What will happen, though, if our attempts to identify extraterrestrial intelligence are successful and we manage to pick up a signal amidst the deluge of radio interference that floods the SETI antennas? For some, even speculatively attempting to answer that question is a display of extreme presumption and hubris. After all, for over 50 years, SETI researchers 
have pointed their telescopes toward the stars in the hopes of picking up such a signal. If we haven't won the extraterrestrial lottery in all that time, why worry about what would happen if we got the winning ticket? To put it simply, the odds of SETI researchers winning the large jackpot are increasing as they purchase more and more tickets. The search is running at a breakneck pace due to the proliferation of new detection technologies and the exponential growth of computing capacity. Within a few decades, we might unearth proof of extraterrestrial life, barring the fact that they are either extremely discreet or non-existent. So again, then what? In the spring of 1960, astronomer Frank Drake performed the first modern SETI experiment, whimsically dubbed Project Ozma after L. Frank Baum's fictional Queen of Oz. What few people realize is that he actually detected something. While pointing his antenna at the nearby sun-like star Epsilon Eridani, Drake heard a strong hammering signal. Surprised by how quickly his search succeeded, he wondered, what do we do now? The pulsating bleats emanating from Drake's speakers were quickly determined to be interference from Earth, not aliens attempting to contact us, as he proceeded to answer his own question by assembling more equipment. Modern SETI receivers watch hundreds of millions of channels concurrently, but Project Ozma could only tune to a single frequency. As a result, receiving a signal is neither unusual nor exceptional. In fact, it is common to receive a few hundred with each scan. This, of course, does not thrill anyone. Rather than manually determining if these signals are likely to represent extraterrestrial intelligence or, like in Drake's case, simply more radio static created by humans, experts rely on complex software to do the heavy lifting. Signals that manage to evade this kind of automated analysis are quite unusual. There will be further testing, though, if and when that takes place. To rule out hardware malfunctions, programming mistakes, or practical jokes, the experiments running astronomers eventually request confirmation of the finding from another observatory. All of these suggestions appear to imply that people would deal with a finding in a serious manner, and they are totally valid. Nevertheless, due to the lengthy verification process, such intriguing signals are likely to elicit a reaction that is chaotic and perplexing. There is no policy of secrecy in SETI, thus word of the possible detection will spread via researcher blogs and tweets during that period. You can be sure that word will have spread far and wide before any formal news conference proclaiming the discovery of the aliens. No one disputes that a genuine discovery would make headlines. In 1996, the public demonstrated their ability to handle an extraterrestrial finding when scientists revealed that a rock from Mars had fossilized bacteria. These microbes were described as having tube-like structures that were smaller than one hundredth the width of a human hair. Obviously, no one in 1996 gave a hoot about dead protozoans, Martian or otherwise. Since humans are relatively young when it comes to technology, we've only had radio technology for a century. It's safe to assume that any intelligent life we encounter will be far more evolved than us. This is why SETI actively seeks out such signals. Though it may terrify some, the majority of people do not perceive it in that light. The National Geographic Channel, the SETI Institute, and the University of Connecticut conducted a survey in 2005 that revealed that 72% of Americans would be excited and hopeful to hear of an extraterrestrial signal. 20% admitted to feeling anxious and nervous. Given that any signal we find is likely to come from being hundreds of light years removed, a supposedly safe distance, maybe it's not too unexpected. Plus, we won't have much information beyond the signal's presence to work with initially. On the other hand, you can wager your salary that every single telescope on this planet will directly target the broadcast. Is a star waiting there? Does it have planets? Scientists may breathe new life into NASA's terrestrial planet finder, a delayed project by rousing it from its slumber, injecting it with renewed strength, and launching it into orbit in the mad dash to discover more. There are some things we could learn quickly about the signal source. Within a thousand light years lie tens of millions of stars. Consequently, a few arc minutes separate them in the sky on average. A high resolution radio telescope, such as the Jansky Very Large Array in New Mexico, has a beam size of about five arc seconds at the commonly used SETI frequency of 1420 megahertz. It would have little difficulty pinpointing which star hosts the detected aliens. We'll know exactly where they live. Moreover, there is more. 
Looking at the small changes in each extraterrestrial transmission might teach us something, thought radio astronomers Jim Cordes and Woodruff Sullivan 20 years ago. The Doppler effect, which modifies the frequency of a signal in relation to its motion, and the atmosphere or daily rotation of an extraterrestrial planet both contribute to these subtle but noticeable alterations. In theory, precise measurements may reveal the extraterrestrials' yearly and daily epochs, planet sizes, moon populations, and even atmospheric and magnetic field compositions. While those with a technical bent would find it interesting, the general public will naturally wonder, what are the aliens trying to tell us? That, of course, assumes that they're saying anything, that they've included a message in the signal. After all, the extraterrestrials might withhold commentary if they want us to reply first, perhaps so they can gauge what level of conversation is appropriate. Assuming, however, that extraterrestrial is attempting to convey some message to us. The message bits alone may be difficult to understand. In order to make ourselves more sensitive to faint signals, SETI observations build up and become staticky for a few seconds or minutes. The longer the exposure period, the fainter the object you may picture. This is directly related to astronomical photography. Regrettably, similar to how a lengthy exposure would completely erase the fast flashes of an optical pulsar, these extensive SETI observations would also smooth out any message. For instance, in order for scientists to detect an extraterrestrial signal that resembles a television signal, they would require an antenna that is around 10,000 times bigger than the average radio telescope used today. It would take a significant investment of time and resources to construct such a massive antenna. However, after a signal's detection, it's reasonable to assume that research money would be practically unlimited, unlike today's situation. Meanwhile, the general population would have to face the reality of celestial companionship. Just we wouldn't know what they're like, nor what we might learn from them, only that they exist. Maybe if we knew we weren't the only ones in the cosmos, it would bring us all together like never before. Naturally, following the early space missions that revealed Earth to be a small blue sphere, some speculated that the same would transpire. How humans respond is something we must await. Certainly, some might feel uneasy about the prospect of discovering extraterrestrial life among the Milky Way starfields. The long-term effects, however, would undoubtedly be the most significant ones if a SETI detection were to occur. And these would affect everyone. The degree to which a signal would alter the lives of our descendants depends on whether we can decode any attached message. This might sound like a tractable problem, merely a matter of time and effort. After all, humans eventually deciphered hieroglyphics, linear B, and other messages that once seemed as inscrutable as teenage behavior. But the universe is old, and consequently the content of any message might simply be incomprehensible to our three-pound hominid brains. And nonetheless, we might look on the bright side and pretend that we do, in fact, understand what the aliens are trying to tell us. Given their probable advanced technological state, the data may cover a wide range of realistic subjects, including the laws of physics and astronomy, the nature and scope of cosmic biology and intelligence, the feasibility of travel at the speed of light, and countless other subjects that currently make up science fiction. If we were to suddenly find out about these things, it would cause a huge break in our species history opening a wormhole to a future that we might not reach for thousands or millions of years otherwise. In addition to the deluge of information that would be available, we would have to face the reality that the disparities between us humans are insignificant in comparison to the gap between aliens and ourselves. Some people, such as Seti's Tartar, suggest that this would lead to more human harmony and less worry that we're on the road to destruction. After all, if they've survived their technical adolescence, then we could too. Sociologist Don Tartar of the University of Alabama Huntsville is less sanguine. During the early days of space research, when Earth was depicted as a small blue orb against a wide dark sky, the common belief in the unity of humanity was shattered by following conflicts and terrorist acts, he says. We're back to the usual conflict and competition. And what about a response? If we know where the aliens live, do we dare reply with our own shout out? Or would that, as some argue, merely expose our planet to possible future destruction because we've given away our existence in position? Actually, while nobody can say for sure if extraterrestrials would be peaceful or aggressive, 
For over 90 years, we have been subtly transmitting radio, television, and most obviously, radar signals into space. These leaked signals would be easy for any civilization with interstellar travel capabilities to intercept and use against Earth. The closest would theoretically be able to see the lights from our cities through their own sun's gravitational lens. Any thoughtful response from us would only serve to bolster the data they currently possess. Trying to foretell the long-term effects of a successful SETI mission is, to put it bluntly, an exercise in futility. We can say this much, though. SETI's success will provide conclusive evidence that life exists in the universe alongside pulsars and spotted planets. And while instant brotherhood is unlikely to erupt suddenly on Earth, we'll at least know we're neither the crown of creation nor even particularly exceptional. For as long as our species exists, we'll be aware that we're merely another duck in a row. And you can be sure that news will ruffle a few feathers. Thanks for watching another episode of Voyager. While you're still here, make sure to click the video on your screen for more mind-blowing videos about space.